Uh, welcome everybody to another episode of Leaders Journal. And today we're going to be discussing uh, one of the very interesting topics in Singapore. Uh, and um, it's really called the idea that uh, these generals that we have from the SCF actually go to different um, government agencies. And we want to discuss this idea of leadership. Uh, but when I was thinking about this, I wanted to discuss it, but I wanted to understand a little bit more about how we can discuss it fairly. So I invited one of my buddies, Samuel, and uh, Samuel's online with us here in the podcast. And Samuel, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me on. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sam. I'm a, well, schoolmate of Jason, so we go way back. Um, and I'm actually a professional, right? Public speaking and debate coach. I'm working with clients mainly in the education sector like Anglo-Chinese Junior College, Raffles Institution, St. Margaret's, in addition to private clients on the side. Prior to this, I was uh, a civil servant with the Ministry of Law, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, a short stint in the Ministry of Defense as well. And then in my part-time, married with a uh, Married with two cats, and uh, I'm also uh, in. I've just finished my reserve. very recently, actually, just came out. I am serving as the officer commanding of a rifle company in a uh, guards battalion, and that's uh, great wow. to be here. Yeah. yeah, great, great to have you, Sam. Um, so I know Sam from a long time ago when we were in ACJC, and I remember that he was uh, super into debate uh, last time, and actually now he's still into it. So when I was thinking about this controversial thing about um, leadership, whether or not generals um, being uh, put in positions of power in government-linked agencies, uh, we wanna dis I wanted to discuss whether the pros and cons of each one. So Samuel, we're going to be discussing today um, this idea that s are, what are the pros and cons actually when it comes to this idea of them um, putting people who have retired from uh, the army and their mm. generals and we've seen many different examples in Singapore so one a little bit more negative example would be SMRT <laughs> sometimes mm -hmm. uh, you see that um, uh, there are different generals that actually took over um, right. one uh, interesting one uh, recently was this whole uh, Mr. Umbrach right mm -hmm. uh, he was also was general then he took over SPH as the leader Mm -hmm. So I want to hear from uh, you that what's the best way to we, we can actually discuss uh, this kind of topics? That means the both the for and against the pros and the cons. How do you actually do that in debate? Well, the most important thing in debate, which is actually it's the more mundane stuff that even some of my debaters are a little bit reluctant to do because that's not really the uh, part that gets them excited intellectually. Uh, those are the arguments. It's very important that we have a very clear, common understanding and context of what we're talking about. So, I mean, some of the listeners here may not really be aware of the entire structure of the SAF and like how, you know, uh, who these general... Do you want to take that, Jason? Like how we're structured Yeah, in the SAF? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, um, like mm -hmm. you, I'm an officer, but uh, I was a very different... No, uh, actually, when... <laughs> I'll say that... Uh, my time in the SCF uh, was extremely structured, so it actually came across for me uh, and the strengths that I have. Um, I didn't really fit very well as an officer. I did try my best and all that, but um, yeah, I think the idea of being an officer and a general, I think for them, um, mm. they go through the ranks and most of these generals are actually scholars. So they either have a scholarship mm. with the Singapore government uh, and the, or an SCF scholarship then they are earmarked for basically mm -hmm. greatness, right? All the way up. And uh, the interesting thing is that um, I think the SCF has actually mm. a retirement age and early retirement age. Usually when we look at CEOs yep. and all that in the MNCs, they don't have that uh, around at 45, 47. So the, one of the people that mm -hmm. we will be talking about is this guy who is mm -hmm. a 47-year-old um, and um, he actually is going to... He actually... Um, his name is Mr. Tan mm -hmm. uh, Chi Wee. And uh, he used to be a general, and he's actually moving to hit uh, this organization uh, called e mm -hmm. uh, EGDA, so E-C-D-A, so Early Childhood Development uh, Agency. So I think in general, um, uh, the the army they would they will actually rise up the ranks and do, do mm -hmm. very different portfolios until they reach that level, and they kind of need to be retired, uh, and so. 
after their retirement, what is next for them? And I think that then one of the next steps is actually going to hit a different department uh, in the government. Yeah, so either they will be, you know, put in charge of government uh, statutory boards. Uh, they may actually enter ministries as yeah. well. Uh, usually at a fairly high level, we're looking at uh, director level, at uh, yeah. deputy secretary level as well. Um, and of course, some of the examples you highlighted as well will include generals who have gone to government-linked uh, companies like SMRT, as well as uh, Singapore Press Holdings yeah. as well. So that's where, I mean, that's the sort of like the the overall context, right, that we're talking about. We, I, I'm not terribly familiar with uh, examples of individuals who were ex-top um, uh, military leaders from the Singapore Armed Forces who have gone to purely to the private sector. Mm. So maybe there's a little bit of a gap in knowledge from there, but they haven't exactly made the news to the same degree either. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so they haven't, yeah. So... Mm. Yeah. So when we so when we mm -hmm. think about debate, yeah. we talk about the context mm -hmm. and we talk about the background. Okay. The so section? the next thing is that well, we'll usually have um, if we're talking about two sides, right? They will take a position. Very broadly speaking, one side will be saying that well, it's a good thing that this is happening, and the other side will say this is not a good thing that this is happening. Very adversarial, right? And often with both sides not really wanting to give ground and. Uh, that itself is quite controversial because after all, we're trying to find the truth. What is the best way and what really is the way to go about finding um, complete information and knowledge? And the hope is that when we have two sides arguing as strongly as possible for their position, all the individuals listening will be able to synthesize the arguments from both sides and get that middle ground. But for the individuals involved in the debate, they kind of have to take some of their extreme positions. Um, they may be less willing to accommodate the views from the other side as well. Uh, makes us a little bit more aggressive in terms of personalities. That's why like debaters have trouble getting dates sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, but that's also the basis for our legal system. Right, because um, our legal system essentially uses an adversarial system as well, where the prosecutors and the defense are pretty much um, trying to win 100%. So if there is information that is the truth, but doesn't help their case, they're not really going to be willing to share it that much. Um, it, to a limited extent, that's how our political systems tend to work as well. So this is a tradition that we inherited from the, uh, the Westminster system, which is the British system, right? And, um, and that doesn't have to be the way because there is a slightly different type of legal system. Um, some call it a more inquisitional uh, process. I know it sounds scary, like, you know, like the Spanish Inquisition, but it really is meant to be more of a search <laughs> yeah. for the truth right without having this idea of combat so that the hope is that um, the individuals involved in the process don't end up suppressing information and arguing just for the sake of arguing as well yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point um what's mm. interesting about this is that um before talking to you i actually did talk to some people some uh, mm. officers in the Singapore Armed Forces and a lot of the things that they say are actually very much yeah, oh, yes, it can be. Right. <laughs> so um, I when I was asking them this issues mm -hmm. about uh, leadership, uh, is it contact uh, is there even a need mm. for contextual knowledge or is just your leadership skill is enough? Um, I did get very skewed um, um, kind of like um, findings from them. Uh, they didn't really say uh, much. Uh, if not, they will say things mm. very politically correct. And um, uh, when I was going through uh, some of the people, uh, so these are maybe gen, uh, mm -hmm. uh, lieutenant colonels, colonels level, and um, they're actually very, uh, it's almost like um, you're that, talking about my tribe. Oh, yes. Right? And it's, it's that kind of feel. So it's, it's difficult mm -hmm. to get through. And um, so from, that's from one side. On So I think taking a very balanced stand today to mm. really try to figure out and we want to be able to understand mm -hmm. this idea of leadership uh, it can be right it can be wrong but we want to know that uh, nobody's mm. suppressing the truth uh, we can actually talk about it in a they're very plainly um, and we can see both sides and see the yeah, and Jason that's a great point that you raised because um, sometimes when the debaters I'm coaching are told you have to take this certain side it's amazing how after that debate is over, you know, you can just shake hands with your opponents and walk off. 
but they now have locked themselves into that side. And this will continue to be their side until the next debate occurs and then they are assigned the other side as well. And this notion of tribalism actually informs not just how we articulate our views, but even the way that we think. We kind of end up tricking ourselves into thinking, that's my identity. And now every single piece of information that I get, it's kind of going to be distorted, even in my own brain, to fit my narrative. And uh, I think we've seen that somewhat in the US, where the politics is just a little bit more vocal, right? That when the moment you've decided that I am a Democrat or I'm a Republican, every single piece of information that you seek that you now get is interpreted through that particular lens, mm. making it very difficult to change your position. Yeah. So I want to try to avoid that. And debate is supposed to teach you mm. right, how to look at it from both sides. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. I think uh, even as leaders, when we debate and negotiate yep. with people who have very different mm -hmm. and opposing views, there's something that we can, um, we can almost uh, have that... Uh, mindset of not taking a side, but really just opening ourselves up to mm -hmm. uh, both sides of the coin and then coming yeah. out with the decision. One additional thing that we will then ask the debaters to do is you kind of come up with what we call a yardstick, but generally some sort of criteria. Okay. Because if we're going to try to assess mm -hmm. um, this particular phenomenon that we see where um, top military leaders are often parachuted into top positions in government and companies and agencies, yep. When we say it's good or bad, uh, what are we trying to use as the basis for good or bad? Are we looking at those companies? Are we looking at the SAF itself? Are we looking at just very broadly Singapore? But if that's the case, then what's the criteria? Right. Um, our economic output? Are we talking about political stability? So it could be a number of things as well. It's kind of tricky. Yeah. It is, it is. So when mm. I'm thinking about this, um, Maybe mm -hmm. we can actually go into that. Uh, but when I was thinking about mm -hmm. these two parts, there are really two uh, main things I'm, that one side is, for example, it's uh, right. for profit. That means there is like, you know, SMRT, SPH, there's mm -hmm. the bottom line is the bottom line. So there's uh, results mm -hmm. that you see uh, quarterly yeah. and yearly. That's one side. That means mm -hmm. based on his leadership, what's going to happen. But the other side can be a little mm -hmm. bit more gray. So like early childhood development uh, mm -hmm. agency, um, you might not see the impact until yeah. that child exactly. is 20 years old. So it's mm -hmm. it's vague. Um, it You don't mm -hmm. see that results. You will see different uh, initiatives come out. So I'm not sure. How do we actually, how would you think that we could actually structure that? Or is it just like that? That means there are some that's, okay, uh, SMRT, mm -hmm. the profits are going down right. uh, based on leadership. The other one, we kind of, we kind of uh, they can be almost like, um, um, hiding right. behind the clouds and that clouds can be the 20 years of mm -hmm. a child's development. Any other way um, that we can look so at So that's it? one way to look at each independent actor and then just decide, well, this is good in the short term or the long term. But then as um, I was mentioning earlier, there's also a more micro right, analysis of was it good for the agency, but we're also looking at the entire structure of government and then like, is it in general, a right. good thing, right? <laughs> in general, a good thing, right? Mm. To have these generals in general. right, uh, being in place because we might also want to consider, well, what's the counterfactual, right? So what would have been the system if this was not put in place? And then what would have been the outcomes? Um, mm. Again, looking at broader uh, impacts on our on this particular country, right? Um, looking perhaps yep. at some of the other countries in Southeast Asia, our closest neighbors. I know it's very difficult to do a direct comparison. Singapore is very unique, right? In so many ways, but um, it's, very, a, it's a good basis of comparison to see like, well, how, how different might it have been and whether that would have been good or bad on those broad macro yastics as well. Hmm. Mm, it's a very good point. So if I see Singapore as a Sing mm -hmm. Singapore incorporate, and I see them as like um, mm. business unit leaders, I kind of just moving them around. So that's a good uh, mindset. And if I mm -hmm. if I want to say that okay, so if this is yeah. not the way, or if it, mm -hmm. what is the other way, it could be that yeah. we lose them. Singapore mm -hmm. incorporate loses them to yeah. the private sector, and uh, would, which, which might not be beneficial, beneficial, which could be worse. Um, and then of course. This is assuming, yeah. I think we're coming at it from business leaders and all that. So it's still very, you know, yeah. uh, econs minded. We're looking at the bottom line, etc., which is a fair way to assess things. But um, in terms of the, 
the government going all the way to prime minister himself, they may have like non-economic yeah. outcomes that they're concerned about as well. As I mentioned earlier, uh, political stability, yeah. right, uh, and all that as well. So those, those right. which are a little bit harder to assess, which makes it very challenging as well to have this sort of yeah. debate. Hmm. Yep. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I totally agree. So mm-hmm. let's go into the details, but I'm going to frame the question and see whether that question is something that we can actually sure. go for the pros and cons of it. Mm. So the question is, should generals be put in positions outside of the military just mm-hmm. based on leadership rather than yeah. industry knowledge? Yeah. So industry. Mm-hmm. So that's the question. Um, let's do it this way. Um, let's go for the okay. um, pros. Why is it good? Why is it good for mm-hmm. the Singapore government? Why is it good for uh, even right. the organization? Yeah. Usually, um, at this point, we'll probably come up. Uh, my teams will be brainstorming and say, hey, let's try to find all these arguments that can yeah. be as persuasive as possible. Um, a number of ideas uh, come to mind as well, right? Which is that um, when, when they're trying to find people who are going to be coming in, into agencies in Singapore. And Singapore Inc. has always prided itself on being able to transform, change, right, the way that they operate if necessary. And one of the downsides to having individuals who rose to the ranks is that, one, they haven't really seen outside of their particular agency and they may be a little bit more used to doing things their way and not being at the forefront of change. And in general, when we're talking about bringing someone in from the outside, they bring a fresh perspective. Already, they have a basis of comparison between their old organization and their new organization. The interesting thing is, and this may come as a surprise, I think, but I mean, this is just, again, a very colloquial understanding of the SAF way above my pay grade. But the Singapore Armed Forces, it is a fairly complicated, right, um, organization in itself and the individuals who reached the top were not simply just infantrymen who have been doing bayonet drills for the last 30 years they've been handling a very <laughs> complex uh, organization that is uh, constantly upgrading its uh, you know policies as well as its technology and the infrastructure is constantly changing as well it's actually very dynamic and so they're already used uh, and they have moved from department to department as well. And those are very big departments yep. that they were handling, right? Uh, a single division that they were handling in the military might be bigger than the agency that they're heading now as well. So they have that basis of comparison. Yep. And to have that ability to do a, a pros and cons of being able to compare, and they're coming at, coming at this agency a little bit fresh. And so they have the ability to initiate change right from the top and say, no, the, the, the way that we've been doing it um, is actually kind of wrong and we need to change it and let's mm. experiment with something new so that, um, so that you know, we can move forward. Probably some sort of personal benefit as well to show that, hey, this is my legacy and this is what I want to leave behind. I'm sure every leader has that, but at least they bring that extra capacity yep. that someone who's been inside the whole time might not be able to bring. Hmm. Yeah. Good. That's a very good point. Um, the idea that uh, if you just bring an, a somebody mm-hmm. from another industry to mm-hmm. your industry, they will see uh, what they can mm-hmm. actually bring and support mm. that industry. Yeah, so fantastic. Sure. I have one point. Um, this is the idea of, uh, you know, mm. in Singapore Armed Forces, we do the, uh, what do you do that? We do the oh, yeah. um, creed, uh, right? The, the, which are the, the, the our, our pledge? The, we have the officer's creed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, not obviously. Sorry. So, so we have uh, loyalty oh, to. Okay. Um, oh, okay. I think those really are our, our yeah. core values. Yeah, yeah, the seven core values, right? Okay. Yes, our core um, values. It is now fantastic. eight core values. Right? Yeah, they've added yes. one. Yeah, yes, yeah. Safe, are you serious? Safety is the last one. Really? Added. I oh, think yeah. it was seven in our time. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So the last one, mm-hmm. the one of them that I, I it really, mm-hmm. really resounds for me is yep. the idea of mm-hmm. loyalty to country. Mm-hmm. Right, so um, w- one of the things, if I'm able to actually bring somebody mm. who has already been there uh, in the Singapore Armed Forces mm-hmm. for such a long time, and their their career probably would start for guys around uh, mm-hmm. twenty twenty one, and then when they retire at forty seven, yeah. forty five, it's almost twenty four, tw- mm-hmm. almost twenty five years um, that you you know that hey, they they actually mm-hmm. stayed on all this while, and um, the idea that. If I want a, somebody to run one of my government-linked agencies, one of the things I actually want to know is that actually do they, um, 
this whole idea of loyalty mm-hmm. to Singapore and the love for Singapore and the love for the progress that they want mm-hmm. Singapore to see. So that's something that I feel that actually yeah. is also another pro. So, and just to, well, just to add another pro, all right, as well. So uh, well, we can just pile on all the yeah. pros at this point. We can consider some of the cons yeah. to this. Okay, well, let's go for right? it. Um, <laughs> is that when, when you're bringing these individuals in, um, I think, what we also have the ability to do, right, is, I mean, we only see the fact that they're coming in, right? I mean, who else is moving around at the same time? And so that's something else that mm. we have to, uh, and how it impacts the other actors as well, right? But, so it's mm. surprisingly refreshing, I believe, when someone new c- comes in, and of course, they have to be good and willing to learn yep. as well. But when someone new comes in, it's actually a chance for that organization, including your subordinates, to get to do a do-over, right? A new boss is coming in, and Mm. this is actually an opportunity for me to provide my feedback and my input on the way that things should be done. And if the incoming CEO is willing to listen, is willing to take the advice of the subject matter experts, and they're more willing to take the advice of these subject matter experts because they know that they haven't got that uh, expertise. So they're more willing to defer to some of the individuals uh, within the various departments and divisions and listen to them. So this could be an opening that is provided for subordinates, individuals who might never reach the top. But you might not get that chance if it is going to be someone from within the system who already have their ways fixed and they're not willing to listen further to troops on the ground, as it were. Whereas one of the practices, and I do see, to be honest, the generals practicing it as much as possible, um, care for soldiers, one of the core values, right? And now safety, yeah. that's it. Yeah. They've been conditioned, you have to talk to the men on the ground. Yes, it, there'll always be some sort of filter, right? And the men will always be hesitating yeah. to say, tell you everything, but they will tell you stuff. And yeah. I think is this understanding that Mm. you might be a little bit cut off from the individuals and you can't just rely purely on the chain of command. You should listen to your, you know, if you're, if you're a general, you should be listening to your colonels. You should listen to your majors, but you got to work your way down, right? To captains, lieutenant, your sergeants and all the way down to your privates, right? That came out wrong. All the way down to your corporals, right? Okay. And this (laughs) is where, uh, and that practice I have seen right uh, within my civil service time that the generals are willing to take some time mm. and say explain to me as if I'm an, I'm completely a novice which you know they are and it also made some of these individuals like sort of explaining the system realize that this doesn't make sense why have we been doing it the, this whole way and, and uh, a particular military practice which is um, um, what they've called it you know, not AAR, PAR, after action review or post action review. You don't do a lot of that uh, sometimes because you're just so busy in agencies. Just get it done. Just get it done. We're not thinking strategic and you're not mm. thinking long term as well. So every time someone right. new comes in, you feel very frustrated. Oh, I've got to explain everything again to this person. But that might not be a bad thing, you know, and you know, to, to get the chance to be mm. a little bit more critical and look at your own structures and organizations and say, right, I'm giving you a blank slate now. How would you redo everything if you could? And that's not a bad thing for agencies either. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So to add to that point, uh, Sam, what is interesting is that I actually talk, spoke to somebody mm-hmm. uh, from ACTA uh, about this whole idea of um, mm-hmm. Mr. Tan Chiwi coming in. He's going to be taking over mm-hmm. on the 15th of December. and But he did have a ah, session okay. with them, uh, mm-hmm. kind of like a conference bus. So it's, that he's the, it's like almost like the very first time the, mm-hmm. the general comes in and then mm-hmm. uh, addresses everyone. And one thing he said um, um, was that, uh, that <laughs> don't call me sir anymore. Yeah. Call me by my name, right? Mm-hmm. Or in the military. And um, uh, the things that that um, mm-hmm. that the person felt was that uh, he mm-hmm. was actually me down to earth, which is actually your point. If the yeah. person is willing or if the general is willing to listen to the people on the ground, it might be a really good fresh start for them to, to, to actually throw away some mm-hmm. of the sacred cows that's been there for years. So one thing um, that uh, the person I spoke to in ACTA was very interested in and also hopeful is that the idea of the, him coming in and he actually mentioned that he's going to come in and he's, 
he has done a lot of strategy, which generals do. And if the plan doesn't work, we kind of like, you know, move on to something else, which sometimes like, like what you said, that if somebody's too deep into that sector, um, it becomes no more as a, a need that's being served, but more as a tradition that cannot be broken. So that person is actually hopeful that when the general comes in, that if really some mm -hmm. of the things that we've been doing is not working, his ability to listen to the ground and change it mm -hmm. is something she's very hopeful yeah. about. Yeah, but, you know, but yeah. I think we have to be fair as well. And this is another tool that we use. We must always be careful not to generalize, <laughs> okay, right? And um, mm. assume that every <laughs> single person who is ex-military is the same. Right? I mean, we have to recognize the individual. Yep. And so I always tell my uh, debaters, mm. consider a spectrum of actors, right? Because yes, we can have the type of individuals who are very um, motivated to learn, who are willing right, to let everything go and yep. extremely humble. They feel very secure in their positions. I think we also have to account for the fact that there may be individuals right, who kind of can't let go of the past and um, may be yeah. uh, prejudiced into thinking that everything that worked within the military necessarily need to come over and all that as well. So this is just a small caveat, right, to keep in mind as well. But if um, yeah. if they are able to come in, right, with this fresh perspective, then yeah. that's, that's not a bad thing. And especially since we have to consider how much detail do you need to be able to make those big decisions because after all you're not joining as a fresh officer you know on the ground you're essentially yep. being yep. brought in paid fairly well to make very big broad strategic decisions and if you were yep. to ask ceos out there in major companies and you ask them what the average yep. person like let's say you're at amazon and you ask jeff bezos like how is box a yep getting from here yeah. to another location, he probably doesn't know anymore. And there is something very wrong if yeah. he knows that because that means that he's not spending time thinking yes. of the big picture as well, right? And so yes. I, I do think that sometimes, right, the lack of knowledge about that particular industry can be overplayed as well. Yeah. In fact, Jason, like, I mean, more of your area, I think, um, CEOs move yeah. around a fair bit these days, I think. They're kind of like the superstars. I mean, yes. would they normally be necessarily from the same industry? So are they you know, coming in from companies uh, which appears to be a bit of a mismatch as well? Hmm. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, we have seen uh, superstar mm -hmm. CEOs like Elon Musk being able to actually go through three um, uh, very different, diverse uh companies that mm -hmm. he he leads right uh, so for example tesla mm -hmm. and spacex totally different um so we have seen those um i do see that in terms of ceos mm. uh, or even leaderships uh, inside the organizations they do jump mm. around in different portfolios and the premise behind jumping around is to get them uh, almost get their feet wet in almost in, in some of the different uh, mm -hmm. disciplines or divisions so that when they actually go there, go up there, the key is to be danger to know enough that you are, that mm -hmm. you are dangerous when it comes to if right. somebody BSs you. <laughs> yeah, but not so much that you know mm -hmm. the nuts and the bolts. So, uh, so that, that is one, um, that's one area. That's one way of looking at it. That means even in CEOs and, uh, in C levels or in MNC leadership, mm -hmm. there is changes in portfolios as well. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, uh, any other pros? How many would you like? Yeah. I got tons, I also, but yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, uh, so tons <laughs> yeah. as well. Now. So, I, I don't know whether you want to hear even more pros or we can start yeah. going a little bit more pros and cons as well. Uh, yeah. I, okay. So yeah. one interesting <laughs> thing is that um, mm. when I was talking to this person yeah. from Egda, she said that when the, the yeah. when the news first came out, she's like, "Oh no." It's all my children <laughs> going to do left, right, left, right, left, right. Yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think the general population um, mm. would be fearful that, oh my goodness, why is a general coming mm -hmm. to talk about early childhood, right? So I, I think that's the very knee-jerk right. reaction uh, where they bring all the military things and come in. I mm -hmm. did see that when during the infamous um, <laughs> uh, interview yes. uh, of the... Uh, Mr. Uh, right, uh, okay, SPH, yeah. okay, basically, sure, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the CEO of SPH, and and um, they, they came. It it there was a little bit of that um, 
uh, mm-hmm. this is my way, follow right. me kind of feel. But I don't think every mm-hmm. person is. It's I like what you say. Uh, and I like mm-hmm. the way that you say mm-hmm. it. You call them actors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. Right? Uh, why do you uh, call them actors, actually? Wow, okay. I think it's just... It, it's was it more of a, a debate, debate thing? thing or is it, um, we use terminology that will make the, the audience really appreciate immediately, right? That there are individuals with different roles. Okay. And the moment we use the term actors, I think it makes yeah. them realize, okay, they're different actors and different types of actors, right? So that... And they have their respective roles to play. It just um, helps to ensure that right. they are not trying to do something we call hasty generalization, meaning that from a single example, mm. we will now basically end up making a broad generalization, which isn't fair to the entire spectrum of actors right. as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And, I like that uh, too. I will what, use it more uh, it's very funny because we've heard all these things. Uh, you're going to have to do uh, left march, left right, left right. Are we going to have to wear uniform? Do we have to do yeah. that? Gonna <laughs> wake up in the morning at 0530 and do 5 p.m. exercises and all that, <laughs> which is also quite telling. Our perception or the average Singaporean person reacting to these being appointed, yeah. they're not talking about generals. Yeah. They're actually talking about your lieutenants or even sometimes sergeants because if you look at the roles you know these where yeah. you're basically drilling the man and you're exercising everyone this is for yeah. non-commissioned officers and for well fairly low level mm. officers like us right to still be handling because yeah, yeah so yeah, like we uh, a platoon commander has you know the like 30 or so men and then i'll have about 100 plus as a company generals are not doing this Right? I mean, I mean, where was the last time you saw a general leading the 5PX, right? I was like, hey, man, let's go and do this, right? They are doing much, much more sophisticated stuff and much more complicated stuff. They really don't have the yeah. bandwidth to do that. In fact, most of the time, a lot of the generals are probably spent spending their time in offices, you know, trying and in uh, meetings, yeah. etc. Uh, very CEO-like stuff with the additional um, IPPT requirement mm. that a CEO might not have, right? Okay. But... So our <laughs> our perception of who these people are and the way that they're going mm. to be behaving inside an agency is somewhat colored, right, by a distorted view that we have of this as well. So yep. um, it, it might be useful to just reflect on that and consider whether we have the full picture mm. in trying to uh, anticipate, right, and sort of like uh, and judge how these individuals are likely to be behaving in their new organizations. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so that's like the classic mm-hmm. generalization. Of the general is a is a person that uh, knocks you down mm-hmm. in uh, your first yeah. three months and that kind Man. of thing. Okay, Sam. Mm-hmm. So let's move on to sure. the yeah. negative. Okay. How about that? Uh, so one thing comes to yeah. mind, and this is basically an appreciation okay. of the fact that even if you don't focus purely on your subject matter expertise, certain mindsets and yeah. cultures are created within an organization um, based on the roles and requirements Mm -hmm. of that particular organization. The information that you receive, the individuals that you interact with begin to color the way that you see the world. And if you look at the role of the Singapore Armed Forces, they're not exactly there as Singapore's diplomatic arm, if you know what I mean. So um, (laughs) they have to always anticipate Um, potential threats to the nation, which in turn ends up yep. coloring everything as potential threats, right? And that can be a little bit problematic at times, because I mean, when you already have that particular notion that, you know, we have to be as strong as possible, we have to be as robust as possible. Um, it's acceptable sometimes, even if there are collateral damage, right? Or if we end up having to fire people, it's a sacrifice that you're having to make and all that. And that's not wrong from a military perspective, but that can carry over into other agencies as well. And I'm sure even when you have CEOs Mm. coming over uh, from one company to another, the way that they did, right? the, The practices are not necessarily carried over, but the mindset, right? Will often come back as well. Um... 
I'll, I'll give a small example because I'm feeling the pain right now. Jason, I don't know where your allegiance is lie. I'm a diehard Manchester United fan, right? right? And um, okay. uh, one thing that, of course, we're all very sad that the most successful manager of uh, Manchester United's history, Alex Ferguson, retired. Now, yeah. he handed over the reins to David yeah. Moyes, who was the Everton right, manager for the longest mm. time. And David Moyes, even after having spent quite a number of uh, uh, months right, and even one year at Manchester United, he couldn't get out of the small club mentality. He was still thinking that he's managing mm. a small club. And he would often say things like, oh, you know, we're hoping to play at the level of Liverpool, etc. And that's, you know, it, it, it inherently, the fact that he couldn't step out of his small club role, right, was, was there. And yeah. when you carry over some of the um, institutional right, frameworks and the mindsets from the military, it, it might not always gel, right? The expectation that um, individuals will just follow your order, remember, without questioning. That's a bonus yeah. in the military. Yeah. In fact, it's often drummed into us that speed is important. You need to react as fast as possible. You cannot be debating every single order that comes your way from the top. And so they're not used to being yeah. challenged to the same degree. But when you're out there, right, handling agencies and all that, it can then become a point of fiction when you're told to do something. You don't get the uh, rationalization that you were used to getting from other CEOs. And that can then become a point of, uh, uh, a point of tension, right, and potentially a failure point as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, when we think about uh, leaders that uh, I coach, uh, there's also this mm -hmm. idea of either you are uh, taking on the mm -hmm. hat of a dictator, yeah. that means my way or the highway, or this idea of a coach where you want to bring up the, um, you, you know that your team has the answers, mm -hmm. you don't have all the answers. So there might be that uh, preconceived uh, uh, carry over that um, since I am mm -hmm. used to doing it this way in the military, when I go over to the government link side or different entities, uh, there may mm. be such a culture shock, right? Yeah. So that's one pro one mm -hmm. one uh, con. Um, one thing I think um, when it comes to uh, this particular thing, or even when when we talk mm -hmm. about SMRT or or SPH, uh, Singapore Press Holdings, um, this idea of context knowledge. So we, we talked about that like, CEOs don't really need to know have mm -hmm. that context knowledge. But we actually, when we think about that also, um, is context mm -hmm. knowledge important in the first place? So one thing that any leader mm -hmm. would have to do is to really learn and uh, be exposed to so many different things to get up to speed. And sometimes when, we th when, we, when I think about this idea of a CEO, and let's say you have... You have a bunch of advisors and your advisors are the ones that uh, help you to overcome this mm -hmm. lack of context knowledge. But what if the, it's a stalemate where five mm -hmm. advisors say yes and five advisors say no? Your role uh, is to actually bring forth um, the best mm -hmm. decision possible yeah. but without any context knowledge. It's almost like you asked me to go into the war room now, right? <laughs> and you asked me to say that should we do this or this? Both we are on... We are, um, mm. We're on the fence. Jason, what do you think? So is that kind of thing that if you don't have context knowledge, then how on earth would you be able to make that uh, still make kind of decisions um, mm -hmm. when they all look to you to do it? Yeah, so that's one thing. Yeah. Think about that? um, so I think that a lot of institutions will have institutional knowledge and it's very difficult to put it down on pen and paper, you know, with pen and paper and say that, well, here it is, here, read the right. SOPs. And um, <laughs> the danger sometimes is that they do come in and say, where's the manual? Let me read it and then I'll figure it out along the way, which yes. is uh, the way that the militaries operate, the way the militaries have to operate so that you, know, you can have a constant flow of individuals coming in and then uh, learning all these new, new skills, new weapons, new equipment, and then still being able to function. A lot of institutions outside won't function that way, whether unspoken rules, traditions, and customs that you needed some time to have, you know, to, to, to have spent, right, trying to figure out how things work. And when you don't have that immediate appreciation, then you start trying to latch on to anything that is tangible written down to be able to create yeah. those results. So, for instance, um, you look at Singapore Press Holdings, you might be tempted to think, 
What is the tangible way that I can measure output? And I need to justify uh, me being appointed here as the new boss. I have to show some results. But how do I show results? I mean, like people are reading more. How do I how do I quantify that? And often you might end up defaulting to things like, well, how much money are we making? Right. And so if that then becomes the the defaults that you end up going into as well, um, that can become a problem. So that adds to the lack of you know familiarity, right? Not just with the objective subject matter, but also with the institutional culture yeah. that you have as well. Yeah. Another problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but I do feel that like things like um, mm. SPH, mm -hmm. uh, SMRT, these are very mm -hmm. much profit. Uh, the actual business that uh, that there is a mm. profit and loss statement at the end um, that linkages to uh, effectiveness mm -hmm. of that leader is yeah. a little bit more apparent than things like mm. early childhood development agency, right, or even um, other ministries. So I do feel that I think one of the cons mm -hmm. that I can think about is that. If mm -hmm. he takes over ECTA, right. we never know. Whatever the policy CSS and all that, yeah. we actually don't know whether or not it is effective for a long time. So he could, it could be that he did a great job, but we will never know that. Or it could be that he <laughs> actually messed up big time and we will never know that until my children and you <laughs> will be like, yeah. why are you this way? Right? So it could be that. that. So the cons is um, that uh, for agencies like that, uh, where there's really no profit and loss, um, there's no mm -hmm. way of judging whether or not he's a good, he's a, he's a great leader, and after a while, as per different things that happen in the government, he'll be actually mm. kind of like rotated out. And after that three years, we kind of don't know right. somebody else will take over. Like even the the existing, um, I think uh, even the existing mm -hmm. uh, CEO uh, yeah. Jamie Ang. Uh, she mm -hmm. will actually be moving out and usually they move out to uh, different yep. uh, ministries mm -hmm. after that. So it's like um, uh, coming mm -hmm. back to the idea of Singapore Incorporate, uh, they have these leaders that actually do a little mm -hmm. bit of like tour of duty and um, yeah, so that stint there mm -hmm. is, could be short, could be three years, could be five years and then they move on. So we don't know if I were to say that as a Singaporean um, or as a person who's concerned mm -hmm. about early childhood, I want to see, I want to I have accountability of whether or not is he has done positive yeah. impact or negative, yeah. I really wouldn't know. And so I'd I like to know that. build on this notion of accountability. Um, yeah. Agencies, right, in Singapore, and, mo and even more so companies, right, even government-linked ones, will have one particular, uh, one particular and working environment that the SAF might not be entirely familiar with failure because mm -hmm. policies would have failed before and i think that even you know uh even former minister mentor the Kuan Yu has come out and say that yeah some policies we yeah. did were, were not good right and we needed to change them um and uh, companies have run into trouble before as well interestingly and i think this is why um some of the critics right, of this phenomenon have labeled these generals paper generals because they haven't done any yep. real fighting. And uh, in some ways, it's just to mm. disparage the, you know, what have you really done but push papers. But there is a kernel of truth in this, which is that the SAF would not have had to go through what you would consider a point of failure because we've never gone to war. And in many ways, if mm. it has failed, we are in big trouble, yep. right? So, right. <laughs> but what does it mean when a leader who essentially have not met a critical failure at any point in his career or her career, his career for now, because we, you know, really haven't had any yeah. sort of like top, um, right? It's only starting to happen, right? We now have uh, generals or ladies, et cetera, as well. And females, into, right? Uh, into key yeah. positions as well. Took a while because South Force was not available right. for females for a long time, right? But if you think about it, mm. these individuals, probably straight A students, yeah? creme de la creme yep. and pride of their schools. Now they get the yep. top scholarship, right? Uh, the Singapore Armed Forces and are probably president scholars in some cases. Every single command place they go to, they probably excel. Did well in BMTC, OCS. Yep. Did well enough in their commands to be progressively yep. promoted, right? And they are somewhat protected yep. within the system because they never got that big test in a way, right? But... Mm. Suddenly, when you go out, your company could be in trouble, right? I mean, 
whatever yeah. you like, they're not taking your trains and they're not buying your papers. How do you deal with that particular yeah. adversity? Is could be a big issue because mm. uh, I'll bet that your average CEO from the outside who's coming in having done, they would have had a bunch of failed enterprises under their belt. They know how to deal with it, cope with it, and react calmly to it as well, right? And when put under pressure, they can respond. Um, I think the infamous press conference that you were referring to may have been somewhat emblematic yeah. of an ind individual, right? Who not only is being yeah. held uh, you know, and having the, the feet put, uh, put put to the fire for the first time, but is being asked yep. to be held accountable for what is deemed a failure. And when you're new to that, you can't mm. always take it well. And that might not be a good thing for the agencies, right? right? For someone who refused to recognize failure will always be framing everything as a success, which is dangerous, right? At the same time, and may even mm. be uh, self-deluded into always thinking, well, this is fine, right? As well. So... Those could also be issues. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I think um, one more point mm. uh, when it comes to the cons, uh, especially for this one, is the idea of um, if can you actually lead mm -hmm. uh, an organization like uh, mm. uh, Agda if you w when it comes to the passion for children, right? So it's almost like um, if I don't really bother mm -hmm. about like um, mm. children and. Um, I don't really have that passion. That means uh, um, I, I don't really think about it that much. I don't I live, breathe it. Can I really mm. affect that change? So the idea, um, and, it's, and it's something that mm. a lot of people debate on, uh, the idea of is, it pa is passion important? That means um, you are so passionate about something and you're so driven and motivated because mm -hmm. of your love for kids that you actually want to push different ideas and all that. So the idea that I can just drop somebody in and immediately they have... Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't even know whether we, we mm -hmm. can't even test that passion for kids, whether or not they have that metal in them to push for certain things. Because mm -hmm. I'm just so passionate about it, which actually comes down to this other point that the people already mm -hmm. in Agda, um, yeah. What about them in terms of an opportunity mm -hmm. for them to groom, to grow, and to grow upwards? Where I've been there for so long, and now I have such a passion for kids, and I started as a teacher. Uh, and I started all the way down, and now I'm I I probably want to be able to be in a position where I can effect a huge amount of change. So this idea that what about the other people in Acta? Whether or not what 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 opportunities do they have when it comes to that? It could be that really um, it is not the um, uh, the mm -hmm. the model uh, leadership model and the leadership rotation of the Singapore government. So that can might never happen. But when we think about companies and all that, um, the people inside, um, it's always the, if you imagine mm -hmm. you're just the number two or the number three, you've been, you've been always wanting to um, just be in that position mm -hmm. in the future and then you're looking forward and suddenly somebody comes in, you'll be like, oh, mm -hmm. a little bit disheartened. So the idea about the people inside and the idea that um, uh, the passion part, whether or not they even have that passion for transport, do they have that passion for um, newspapers and yeah. things like that? So that's another pro, uh, uh, point. That's a fantastic point, Jason. And um, it, it made me also recall, right, um, some, of the, some of the ways in which um, everything started like shaking out in agencies as well as in ministries, etc. It can often create a divide. Uh, to use the term, I mean, these are colloquial terms that we use, even within the military, right? Um, even the officers themselves, the regulars would have terms like, oh, well, those are the scholar officers. I'm just, I'm just a farmer, uh, yes. Yes. right? And they use the term a lot. And it's farmer, kind farmer, of said, yeah. uh, in a way, it's meant to be self-effacing, but there's a sort of bit of pride as well. Like, I'm going to be tilling the fields yeah. and I am here and I love doing this. You guys are here just because your grades were good, right? right? Do you really care? Can yeah. I really work with you? Yeah. If, in fact, are you my enemy, right, within the system? But even mm. if you're the enemy, I'll just write yeah. you out, right? Because I'm going to be here. I'm yeah. not leaving. I care about this. This is my passion. Yeah. You're just here. Yes, you're my boss, but you leave and someone new is going to come in anyways. And so why should I yeah. even bother to, to potentially have that kind of disconnect, right, between you know, uh, you know, individuals yeah. and departments within any sort of agency or company is not a good thing. But um, 
And sometimes when people are brought in from the military, it's a little bit more acute, I feel, you know, than someone who was uh, formerly yep. just like just from another government agency and all that. If you think about it, the SAF is another yep. government agency as well. They just happen to have tanks it is. Right? Okay? <laughs> and, and guns. But why 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 we have an especially acute level right of like uh, of resentment sometimes mm. against these people because it is perceived yes. that the role is just so different right and uh, they are you know it, 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 they're almost like aliens coming in and filling it as well so uh, there's that yeah. that's another thing that can happen but the feelings are real right and it it can actually contribute to that yeah. and if they are upset enough that they'll never progress to the top then we lose that passion. And they start to leave, right? And one of the complaints mm. that you often hear is that, well, the Singapore Civil Service probably pays well, but are those really the people yeah. who wanted to serve society, right? And who actually wanted to contribute yeah. to society? And are we losing those people due to our system as well? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I like the, um, I, mm. I hear that so often last time. I'm a, it's almost that uh, the, yeah. the idea of farmer and scholar, mm-hmm. it's almost that uh-huh. when you're in the military, the farmers are respected more mm-hmm. than the scholars. And if you are a farmer and mm. you can climb to that level of maybe three mm-hmm. um, kernel level, or, or, um, the, the mm. sentiments on the ground is like, this guy yeah. really got it. He is the guy that went through mm-hmm. war, came back, and kind of like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm with mm-hmm. you. I got my hands dirty. While um, the notion mm-hmm. that we usually have, you know, during yeah. canteen breaks and all that, yeah. oh, that guy's a scholar. It's almost like um, he's, um, he's mm-hmm. an academic. Yeah. He's really bright, but um, mm-hmm. he's just a scholar, you know. Uh, it's just given. So, it's, yeah, there is that disconnect. And uh, I like what you said that sometimes um, the people in mm-hmm. the, on the ground, might have so much more passion and they might just want a chance and they may not be given that because the um, Singapore government mm-hmm. system of leadership is really yep. this whole idea of rotation. We have a general uh, now uh, as the Ministry, uh, mm-hmm. ministry yep. of Education, right? Exactly. <laughs> this is insane, right? And mm-hmm. also Speaker of the House, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Mr. Tan Chuan Jin as well. So we do have a lot of this. And um, if we we're going to land on mm-hmm. this, uh, Sam, um, to just make mm-hmm. this a uh, close, I just want to hear from you um, as the mm-hmm. Singapore government, um, and this is their leadership, um, this is the style mm-hmm. of how they groom leaders and all that. Uh, anything we can talk about, um, um, is this a, mm-hmm. a, is a great system, uh, a negative system? What can we talk about in terms of the Singapore government as a whole? That means SCF mm-hmm. is part of everything. Uh, else. Well, we've always wanted to have SCF and all the other government agencies are meant to be, and they use this term, whole of government, right? And everyone is supposed to be together. And one of the justifications with due, justi- uh, uh, with due merit to their system as well is that we need people to be moving from place to place. So that's where they pick up, you know, these institutional norms and understandings as well. So that when we have these people going all the way to the top, they actually have a much better idea of what every other agency is trying to do so that you don't end up in silos, so yeah. that you don't become very parochial and just protect your turf. Because I've seen those sort of mm. turf battles before um, in my in my work. In yeah. other countries, it's actually very acute because yeah. you can have two different branches of the same military fighting tooth and nail to get equipment, to get resources, mm. right? And there is active animosity between those branches. You can have two different ministries and ministers who are just refusing to talk to each other. And I think that at a very broad, you know, general level, Singapore has less of that because there is so much movement and we don't have that sort of like animosity and Mm. tension coming in, right? Now, we we do kind of take it for granted, but um, when you consider the fact that even within the SAF, right, uh, as part of our conditioning, we were always taught to compete, because that helps our mindset as soldiers, mm. you know, to be able to always be on the edge, be the best unit. But in a way, like platoon A is always right. fighting with platoon B, you know, to be the best. Uh, and then which section is fighting with which section. Yeah. But that goes all the way to the top as well. We give up best combat units and all that. And the fact that it's still a very united system, it's something that they may want, um, even if it came at the cost of being able to have specialists in place 
all the time. And uh, mm. so that's uh, something, right, that we have to consider. And my understanding yep. is that all these generals, as they are progressing through their military path, and especially scholars, some of them are actually rotated into doing ministry work as much as possible so that they get to interact with civilians and see how they function as well. So either yep. within the Ministry of Defense itself or actually seconded to other ministries or even doing uh, secondments to the uh, government-linked uh, companies as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. when, when I was thinking about this idea of uh, how much... If, if Singapore government is, uh, mm. we call it Singapore Inc., right? How much mm. money have I invested mm -hmm. in that one person when it comes to mm -hmm. leadership development? So that's one thing also. When we think about, you know, every, um, mm -hmm. for organizations, if I mm -hmm. bring you to a course, especially yeah. for small, medium enterprises, mm -hmm. if you go for a course, I invest money into you, I bond you. Right, so my hope is the bond is that my hope is that actually you live out that bond. You, you don't you don't exercise that bond. You carry on. So throughout the years, these generals have gone through so many so many different kinds of um, mm -hmm. uh, command and staff college. For example, they might have been a scholarship to Harvard and Oxford, mm -hmm. which cost a bomb. Um, uh, they might have uh, maybe even gone to the mm -hmm. top military schools yeah. of leadership in like West mm -hmm. Point in the in the states. So the idea is that I've invested so much of it. Um, if I can spread out that, if I can carry on and move that retirement mm -hmm. from 40 over to 50, right, then it's an increase in mm -hmm. ROI for me. The worst thing I want to do, uh, worst thing to hear if I'm Singapore in corporate is that mm. this general goes yep. and joins a private firm. And all the things, all the investment I have on that person just mm -hmm. goes to the private side. So I think it's one retention mm -hmm. strategy as well so that they can actually carry on and serve the nation and yeah. serve the public. And I think this is where we have to look at where they've been sent. I mean, sometimes uh, we have in, uh, you know, mm. uh, people on the interwebs right, <laughs> complaining that, oh, they're ruining our companies and all that. We got to remember, well, they're usually sent either to statutory boards, ministries, but even the companies they're sent to would be, you know, uh, government-linked uh, companies uh, under Tomasic yep. Holding, etc. And... I think we've always had this appreciation, which is not always uh, top of our minds, but those companies were never meant to function like purely private actors with profit and shareholders, yeah. you know, as the only thing that they have to care about. In the end, they are considered national mm. assets and they're supposed to help the whole Singapore project mm. along because um, like it or not, let's see if we needed to evacuate people from some country, um, SI is going to have to do it, even if as a private company, yeah. they don't really want to do it, but they're going to have to do this as well. And, hmm. and you can almost understand why if this is the way that we're going to have to consider some of our big national companies as national assets and an extension of the state, but not nationalized because you know that's not where they want to be. So they're trying to have their cake and eat it as well. But this probably provides some assurance, right? That these... Um, entities still commercial, still doing everything possible to drive the economy, yep. but still available, right, as an asset to the state, dependable, reliable, um, probably gives a lot of comfort to the powers that be, but in turn benefits these companies as well. Because when you are assured of the fact that these companies, right, are in good hands and the state needs them, the state's not going to let yep. them fail either. Right. So in a way, so yeah. is that the yeah. way to go in terms of, you know, having our, uh, these companies function, always having this gigantic safety net, right? It's that, uh, way above our pay grade. But I, it, to me, at least it looks like that's the way that, uh, we were designed to function as well. Mm. Yeah. So really the whole idea right. of uh, mm. all the chess pieces together are still under mm -hmm. the same control. And hopefully, if anything happens, we meet as many people who we can, uh, who mm. are on our side and uh, who we've worked with so so much, and we mm -hmm. we know that background and that trust is there, and we can move this whole Singapore. I like mm -hmm. the idea, of Singapore project yeah. forward. So, yeah, I got one sure. uh, one interesting thing. So, if I'm mm. thinking about this idea, like if if the general is able to go and go to take over <laughs> right, sure. early childhood development uh -huh. agency, 
right? If we mm-hmm. say that the general um, can take over, I just want to f- figure out whether or not uh, would somebody, mm. I know it's a bit ridiculous, right? Would mm. somebody from ACTA be able to take over the general's role? I actually, uh, if we believe that <laughs> like context knowledge is, is not mm-hmm. the most important thing, and let's say that person has all the skills, uh, all the clearance required to actually be that. Um, would that be even uh, something, I mean, it's just a playful thing, but would that be even something that anybody in the SF will consider? And I don't uh, think so, actually. I'm actually going to disagree a little bit there, right? Not to the degree where they're going to, where our next uh, chief of army will be Mr. Jason Ho, you know, like has come in and be the general, right? <laughs> right. But, I was pleasantly surprised to find that the military, partly because of the constraints that they may have, but they'd be willing right, mm. to bring people from the outside in for roles which were traditionally performed right. within the military itself. right? And there's more commercialization than we would think. Mm. Uh, even we'll talk like mundane stuff like the food we eat you know, used to be prepared by the guys themselves yeah. and like now everything is essentially... Yeah. Yeah, SFI. SFI. Government linked, yeah. right? But it's still a private yeah. actor. Um, yeah, they're willing to bring in like psychologists and psychiatrists, you know, and individuals who are able to um, mm. provide commentary on these things, which, you know, we on the way that we structure right. our systems. Um, uh, even our physical mm. training, uh, a lot of it is actually done by uh, individuals who are coming from the outside into the camps to provide the training. They're not actually um, SAF regulars, but they're actually mm. vendors that they're willing to do so as well. So at least mm. at that level, right, um, there is a little bit more that I think there is comfort in getting expertise from the outside. Partly due to mm. the way that the military was founded, I think, right, that helps with that because uh, we don't have the like 200 years of worth of history, like like the United States Marine Corps, where you yeah. know, uh, uh, where we were founded, uh, uh, like to to and to have been fighting wars constantly, relatively new military yeah. still in the grand scheme of things, and it was founded with a great deal of help from other militaries, and so therefore we were very used to getting help and expertise from the outside, and I think that makes us mm. just that little bit more comfortable in terms of uh, getting advice, right? And being able to listen to others as well. But whether they're going to be happy to have someone come in, probably not, right? To say that here's three star, yeah. right? We can yeah, give yeah, it I don't to think you. so. Yeah. <laughs> because there's some traditions which are wrapped up as yeah. well. But uh, what I understand was that the military yeah. was flexible enough to have come up with what I understand to be a fairly unique uh, uh, rank structure which is called the military expert system the mm. ME system and uh, mm. essentially mm. the military expert system is sort of like somewhere in between commission officers and non-commission officers and the warrant officer types as well Right. but they are willing to bring in individuals who as, who have been operating outside let's say you're a, you're a lawyer right? and you've be, only been a lawyer this whole mm. time but if they want to bring you in into the into the military legal system, then you know then they're really not mm. going to be asking you to go to officer school and go to OCS. It's a, it's a giant waste of time. In fact, in fact, if you recall, when we yeah. wanted to bring doctors into the military, we just gave that we just gave like hey, yeah, yeah straight away captain, captain right and you get it straight away. So we were comfortable with doing yeah. these sort of things. You see, it's the expertise that matters more. We're willing to accommodate yeah. you with ranks, etc. Mm. And now people can just come in at a fairly yeah. high uh, ME level, right, with uh, appropriate level of pace. Mm-hmm. And 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 even though they would have had very little background within the military itself as well. So interesting yeah. developments, right? And I'm at least glad to see that we're yeah. able to change in some of these circumstances and are fairly adaptable as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. refreshing. Very refreshing. <laughs> All right. So we're going to uh, come to the close. And um, we have... Mm talked about um, and debated and, and discussed about the pros and cons uh, uh, for you guys listening or watching what do you think uh, what is your take on that uh, comment uh, about this whole idea of um, generals whether or not they should be hitting government agencies what's the pro what's the con what is your stand so thank you so much Sam uh, for your time and um, yeah I'll see you guys in the next episode right, thank you Jason thanks Sam thanks everyone